Oh, oh, hello. I'm Scott Paulson. I work here at the UC San Diego Library, and we're in the very distinctive Geisel Library building, that wonderful, iconic, William Pereira-designed, brutalist, spaceship-looking building. And how delightful to be here with you today. Um, I'm told that you want to know more about the Library of Congress call number system. And that's why we've gathered here together with our wonderful camera person. Uh, so speaking of the Library of Congress call numbers, look, this book, M175T69, that's a distinct call number that indicates it's a toy piano score. And that call number only exists because our library, our UC San Diego Library, asked the Library of Congress to create a subject heading and call number for toy piano scores because of our many, many years of commissioning new works for toy piano at our annual Toy Piano Festival. We're world famous in San Diego County for that festival. Can you hear the sound of freedom up, up ahead? That's a jet going by. It's just so inspiring. Anyway, this script was prepared. Relax, it's only one page long. Uh, let me just tell you that the Library of Congress was established in 1800. I remember it like it was yesterday. 1800. Mm. Under the direction of the first two congressional librarians, in fact, uh, the library grew to some 3,000 volumes quite quickly. Sadly, this initial collection was destroyed in 1814 during the British attack on the city. In 1815, Thomas Jefferson's personal library was purchased by Congress as the basis of a new collection. Jefferson's library marked an important change in the scope of the library's collection um, in that it was not limited to historical and legal works, but rather reflected Jefferson's own interests in philosophy, history, geography, science, and literature, as well as political and legal treatises. His collection also includes works in language other than English. When the disastrous fire of 1851, and this is a different fire, it's not the same fire. Let me establish that by just doing this fire sound effect. Different fire, 1851, another tragedy. That fire consumed nearly two-thirds of that collection I just discussed with you. Appropriations were made chiefly to replace what had been lost, rather to, than to expand that library. But this mindset changed slowly, and in a period of 40 or so years, the library collection surpassed one million items, setting the record for the largest library in the United States! Exclamation point. As the catalog grew, so did the problems and solutions within the classification system. And again, we're talking about the Library of Congress call number system, just to remind you. The organizational schemes for the Library of Congress endured many iterations from conception until the late 20th century, each classifier built upon the last. Melville Dewey created the most widely used and popular classification system, uh, and known and still used today, called the Dewey Decimal System. So if you invent something, just name it after yourself, okay? Don't be shy. Other classifiers, such as Charles Ami Cutter, and also c contributed to the development of the schemes, creating the Cutter Expansive Classification System, which is an alphanumeric code. Remark remnants of his work can be found on every book in the LC system as the Cutter number, the third line of a call number, an homage to Cutter. And by the way, that is used as a decimal. It's not a whole number. That's a, that's a trick question when you're sorting these things. More about that later when you get trained on how to reshelve books. Anyway, enough about this homage to Cutter. Uh, but although one more thing, he also contributed to the development of the modern dictionary system. I should mention that because it's here. Anyway, in 1897, the Library of Congress hired two individuals that would forever change the classification system. James Christian Meinich Hansen and Charles Martel. The entire focus of their work was to study the possibilities of developing a new classification scheme that offered room for newer developments in classification while still being unified and comprehensively sound. One last paragraph and then we're done, everybody. Short one, too, a short paragraph. Hansen and Martel concluded the new classification should be based on Cutter's expansive classification as a guide for the order of classes, 
but with a considerably modified notation. Work on the new classification began in 1901. The first outline of the Library of Congress classification was published in 1904 by Charles Martel and J. C. M. Hansen, now known as the two fathers of Library of Congress classification. And that's the story of the Library of Congress classification system. Two more things before we go. Um, I do many things here in the library building. One of them is I am the university carillonneur. And that's a fancy French word for carillonneur, someone who plays the carillon, someone who plays the clock chimes, which are located on the roof of Geisel right above us. And we've commissioned many works for the carillon. And I always like finding undergraduates more specifically uh, and ask them to write pieces for the carillon. And for many of these pieces, we had a chance to even catalog them into the library's circulating holdings with the appropriate Library of Congress call number M172. That's a music score for a carillon. And probably more specifically, yeah, M172. And then the next item on the uh, call number would be indicative of the composer's last name. So Elsa Jenny Bliss wrote this lovely piece called Renewal. And it's M172, which means Carillon, and B55, and that is specifically relating to Elsa Jenny's last name, Bliss. And R4 is indicative of the first word in the title, Renewal. Maybe sometime we can go up to the Carillon and I'll play this for you. That will require extra funding, but hopefully we can do that. <laughs> and the truly last thing I want to do today, now that we're atop this iconic spaceship building, is play a little theremin for you. Theremin, I feel, is the official instrument of Geisel Library because it's so spaceship chic. It's also been the most ideal instrument to be involved with during the pandemic because to perform on a theremin, you just wave your hands near the antennae. You don't um, finger anything or hold anything or blow in anything. You just wave your hands near the air. And that, that is pretty safe in a pandemic time. You can even share the instrument and <laughs> not get in trouble. So just a few little spooky notes. And if we're lucky, um, the creator of this video might be willing to take some shots of the library as a parting goodbye. And maybe we'll even turn it into a a spaceship taking off, if we're lucky, or you can just use your imagination. Pretty one. Middle, middle, down. Middle. Uh, you don't have to film this part. This is just me talking to middle, up, middle, middle. No. <laughs>